Good afternoon, everybody. It's so good to have you here. And so nice to see people who are coming back who we've uh, seen here before, joining us for our webinar series with Classical Pursuits and Worldwide Quest. My name is Wendy O'Brien. I'm a leader uh, with uh, both of those organizations. And I'm here today with Melanie Blake, the Executive Director of Classical Pursuits, and the wonderful Samantha Clark, who you never get a chance to see, but she's doing all the technical things behind uh, the screen for us today. She's at uh, Worldwide Quest. Uh, we're really excited to have Melanie uh, having a chance. Uh, we're switching roles today. I get to host and uh, Melanie is presenting. I'm so looking forward to hearing uh, while she has to, to tell us about uh, about the literature of Italy, of Sicily in particular. I'm so looking forward to this. Just a quick couple of things before we get started. Uh, remember that if you have any problems with uh, the technical elements, please put your questions or concerns into the question section. And if you have um, questions for Melanie, I'm gonna be monitoring uh, the chat box across the next hour. Put your questions in there and after Melanie's presentation, we'll be sure to, to raise um, them uh, with her. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Melanie. Good afternoon, Melanie. Good afternoon, Wendy. Uh, good afternoon, Samantha. And hello, welcome to everyone who's on the with us on the presentation today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, as Wendy said, I'm Melanie Blake, and I am going to take you today on a literary journey through Sicily. And I put this uh, first image up, uh, it's taken by NASA, where you can see most of Italy and all of Sicily. And I put this particular image up because it was just it was so dramatic and it, it really got me thinking about all the all the things there are to see and do and taste and smell in in, in Italy and in Sicily and all over the world. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm ready for some action, I'm ready for some drama, I'm ready for some adventure, and we are getting so close. Uh, um, and this trip is of course in, or sorry, this webinar is in connection with our trip to Sicily that's scheduled for November 10th to 21st of this year. Um, we're feeling good and confident that we are going to be able to travel in the fall. And I'm super excited about, um, you know, this increasing likelihood of resuming of resuming travel. And I know Worldwide Quest uh, and all of you are too as well. It's been a long time. Um, so anyway, lots of drama, lots of action, lots of adventure uh, on the Mediterranean island of Sicily today. So let's get started. And just... Um, and we're going to go throughout the island. You you can see pretty. You can see the whole island here. The lights of Palermo uh, on the north coast here, and uh, Catania and Syracuse closer on the Mediterranean coast. And we're going to go to all of those places and more. So let's get started. And I wanted to start with a couple of quotes from some well-known Sicilians. Uh, the first is Roberto Alajo. Oh, sorry, Al <laughs> Alajo who wrote Palermo e una cipola. Palermo is an onion. Uh, he's a journalist uh, born in Palermo. And he said in his book that he, uh, uh, that's just called Palermo in English, uh, if you are born on the island, you'll find it hard to write of anything else. And a figure that uh, many of you may know, Giuseppe di Lampedusa, uh, in a letter dated 1957, uh, wrote to a member of his family that Sicily is Sicily, 1860, earlier, forever. Um, he's referring, of course, to um, the year, the, the time of Italian unification, uh, the invasion of Sicily by Garibaldi, and the, the period when he sets his famous book, The Leopard, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But I put those two quotes up because they really demonstrate the the pull of Sicily to both for travelers, um, whether you know traveling for for leisure, for recreation, for writers, uh, writers from throughout history, really for millennia, have come have come to Sicily and written about it, and to native Sicilians themselves. Um, there's a kind of a pull, a magic, and um, that that really 
is hard to explain, but I'm going to try. And um, and also the quote from Lampedusa, especially, um, you know, he's he's talking about this Sicily is Sicily earlier and forever, you know, a huge expanse of time. And throughout throughout the throughout the periods I'm going to talk about, Sicily has changed a lot. It's been influenced um, by a lot of different people, but it has it has taken those influences and also remained Sicily. And so what does that mean exactly? Let's let's find out. So first, just to orient ourselves, um, just a kind of zooming in from the from the NASA photo, um, a, a map of Sicily. So you have the capital Palermo in the north. We are actually going to start in the middle of Sicily in Enna. Okay, and then we're gonna go, we're gonna pop up to Palermo, and then we're gonna make a swoop around the island. We're going to go down to the Mediterranean coast to Agrigento or Grigenti uh, and the Valley of the Temples along the southern coast to a town, a town called Noto and also Ragusa here, up to um, the ancient capital Syracuse, Syracuse, and finally we're going to finish on Mount Etna. And um, so there's, as you can see, there's lots of other places to talk about. Um, I'm not going to be able to cover them all, but I'm just here to give you a little bit of taste of the literature of Sicily and what awaits you on the trip as well. So, you know, as I've hinted at, there's been so many different groups of people who have come from Sicily. Um, the island was first inhabited about uh, 10,000 years ago. And since then, lots of different groups have made their mark. So you have uh, some of the the earliest groups that were that were there um, before colonization, like the Siculi, the Sicani, and the Elamians. Uh, later, you had Phoenicians and Greeks. Um, the Greeks were followed by the Romans. So both, you know, Greeks and Romans, both uh, powerful empires at different points. You know, always. The, the borders of of what uh, are always changing, and then after the uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire, you had um, Vandals and different Goths, especially the Ostrogoths, um, the Byzantines, um, of course, who and the Byzantines arrived um, around the fifth century BCE. Um, there was the Sicily was conquered by Arabs from North Africa, and then shortly thereafter by Normans, uh, later by the Bourbons. A uh, very complicated dynasty with kind of covering France, Spain, and other points beyond. And and people continue to come to Sicily today. Most of the uh, current migrants to who settle in Sicily are from uh, Romania, Tunisia, Morocco. Sri Lanka actually and Albania. So so many different people coming to Sicily for all kinds of reasons for thousands and thousands of years and um, each contributing or leaving their mark in a different way. And the literature that we're going to talk about will reflect that. So we had zoomed in right with the with the map of Sicily here. We're going to zoom out just a little bit one more time um, just to illustrate you know why was why were there so many different cultures um, and influences mixing either peacefully or not peacefully because there you know there's there have been both throughout the throughout the ages well of course you can see that Sicily it really is at the center of the Mediterranean basin right you have Greece nearby and what's you know Greece also Macedonia um, you have France and Spain, of course. Um, to the south, you have Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia. Uh, you have what's now, or what was the Levant of the Middle East, um, what's now Lebanon, Syria, and other parts of, of the Middle East. So you had different civilizations coming from all over the Mediterranean basin to this island in the center. And we're going to start in the center, as I said, at Enna, uh, called by Cicero 
the Mediterranean Maxime, um, which kind of as which kind of means the being the ultimate of being in the middle of everything, um, and uh, it really is at the the heart of Sicily. It's called the navel of Sicily. Um, Cicero, who was a Roman orator and lawyer and statesman, uh, was there uh, for quite some time. And he was there um, kind of in, in a legal capacity to investigate um, the supposedly corrupt, corrupt actions of the Roman governor of Ares. And when he was there, he wrote a lot about one of the most famous legends of Sicily and a legend that I think we all know um, of Demeter or Ceres and Persephone or Proserpine, Proserpina. And he writes... He gives us a little bit of insight into how important this legend is. Uh, he writes, it is an old opinion that the whole island of Sicily was consecrated to Ceres and Libera. Not only did all other nations think so, but the Sicilians themselves were so convinced of it that it appeared a deeply rooted and innate belief in their minds. For they believe these goddesses were born in these districts and that corn was first discovered in this land and that uh, Libera or Prospina was carried off from a grove in the territory of Enna. And when Ceres wished to seek her and trace her out, she is said to have lit torches at those flames which burst out at the summit of Etna, carrying these torches before her to have wandered over the whole earth. And just to refresh your memory a little bit, I have a read just a very short excerpt of the myth of uh, Demeter or Ceres and Persephone or Proserpina, um, as told by Ovid in his Metamorphoses. Ovid says, first Ceres broke with crooked plow the glaive, first gave to earth its fruit and wholesome food, first gave the laws, all things of Ceres came, of her I sing, and oh that I could tell her worth in verse, in verse her worth is due. All right, so the, really a fundamental role assigned to Ceres. Ovid says, all things of Ceres came. And he continues uh, giving a little bit of an account of the myth. Um, so in the myth, uh, Persephone or Proserpine, Proserpina is uh, by Lake Ragusa. And Ovid writes, while Proserpine once dallied in that grove, plucking white lilies and sweet violets, and while she heaped her basket, while she filled her bosom, in a pretty zeal to strive beyond all others, she was seen, beloved, and carried off by Pluto. Such the haste of sudden love. The goddess, in great fear, called on her mother and on all her friends, and in her frenzy, as her rope was rent, down from the upper edge, her gathered flowers fell from her loosened tunic. This mishap, so perfect was her childish, childish innocence, increased her virgin grief. The ravisher urged on his chariot and inspired his steeds, called each by name, and on their necks and manes shook the black rusted reins. They hastened through deep lakes and through the, through the pools of Pelici, which boiling upward from the ruptured earth smell of strong sulfur. And of course, um, Pluto or Hades takes Persephone or Proserpina to the underworld. And so you can see Proserpina here on the right, holding a pomegranate in a painting by Rossetti. And um, on the left is Demeter or Ceres. And this is a fifth century BCE, you no, know, fourth century BCE Greek statue. Of, of Ceres. And um, so Pluto takes Proserpina down, and of course Ceres is distraught. And as, uh, or as Cicero says, she, she makes Etna explode, she carries lamps and torches, searching, searching for her daughter. Um, and she's so distraught at the loss of her daughter that the earth itself begins to die, right? And eventually, and I'm, I'm, there's, a, there's a lot of tellings of this myth in different places, so I'm just, just giving a little bit of a summary. But eventually, 
um, Ceres and Pluto work out a deal where um, for part of the year, Persephone can come back up from the underworld uh, and stay with her mother. And there we have summertime. And other times she is down in the underworld and we have the winter time. And the periods where she comes up, where she comes down, they they vary according to the different tellings. But that's the that's the basic structure. Um, and the pomegranate that she's holding is because um, Pluto tricks her. He says she can go up and she is very happy because she doesn't want to be in the underworld with Pluto. But um, she eats these pomegranate seeds and because she's eaten the fruit of the underworld, she can go up, but she has to come back down again. So it's all it's all part of the all part of the deal. Um, and you can see there's a statue of um, Persephina being carried off. And this is in the city of Catania near Mount Etna. And here is Lake Ragusa, where she was supposedly gathering flowers while she was taken away. And in his book, um, the Golden Honeycomb, a really beautiful book about Sicily that I recommend to anyone. Um, Vincent Cronin writes that part of the reason that this myth, which explains our seasons, um, the rhythms of, of the earth, um, part of the reason that it's been so important for so long is that it illustrates the multiple pattern of human life, of the rhythm between sorrow and joy. It is at once a particular, quite simple story and a universal truth susceptible of countless interpretations. Um, and I will post the myth as recounted by Ovid um, in the follow-up email so that you can see it. Okay, we're going to move on from um, Ceres and Proserpina, although we will get back to Greek myth, a Greek and Roman myth, um, to go to Palermo, the capital of Sicily on its north coast. And uh, we have some words here from the famous German poet and philosopher Goethe, who traveled to Sicily in 1787. And sailing in, he's, of course, he's sailing into Palermo, right? There's no other way to get there at the time. He says, it might be long before we could again enjoy such a treat for the eyes from such a vantage point. And I couldn't get you quite go to his vantage point in a photo, but I did uh, want to show this kind of panorama of Palermo. You can see set in this valley called the Concodoro, the, the golden shell. And it really, really was kind of a wonder to everyone who, who sailed into it. Um, you can see uh, another aerial view, this of the port itself. Uh, maybe not quite as romantic looking as it was in Gota's day, but still pretty spectacular. And a view of the port area, this is from a 19th century painting. And Gota, I'm oh, sorry, I'll just uh, go there in one second. And Gota actually, he spent about, like, he, like a lot of travelers, he came to Sicily, which, um, wasn't initially on the, the traditional grand tour of Europe, um, but toward the end of the 18th century, 19th century, it did become become part of this this tour that that wealthier, educated men would make as a kind of completion to their education. Um, and you had uh, people, I know Gota Milton, of course, a little bit earlier than Gota Milton. Um, Tennessee Williams, D.H. Lawrence, you had a, a huge range of people coming to and writing about Sicily. Um, I'm not going to be able to get to all of them, there are just so many, but uh, I will provide some further reading for you. And of course, going back quite a bit earlier than Gota, we had um, other travelers who had been coming during um, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. So here you have a quote about Palermo from a um, a Spanish Muslim writer and geographer called Ibn Juber, and in his travels, he writes of Palermo, that Palermo is the metropolis of these islands, 
combining the benefits of wealth and splendor, and having all that you could wish of beauty, real or apparent, and all the needs of subsistence, mature and fresh. It is an ancient and elegant city, magnificent and gracious, and seductive to look upon. Proudly set between its open spaces and plains filled with gardens, with broad roads and avenues, it dazzles the eyes with its perfection. It is a wonderful place, built in the Cordoba style, entirely from st cut stone known as Catan. A river splits the town and four springs gush in its suburbs. So a really lovely picture that he has painted here of Palermo in the 12th century. Um, and at this time, especially, Palermo was really a mix of um, Arab, Muslim, and European, Christian. Um, Palermo, or Sicily, was um, became under Muslim rule, I think, in 925. Sorry, 965. Um, and then in 1060, it went to the Normans. So the time of Arab rule was was pretty was pretty short, but it was quite influential. And in the early days of the of the Norman rule, there was a um, there were a lot of Arab scholars and architects and others working for the Norman court. Um, there was a real mixing of ideas. You can see here. This is from the um, a palace called Kuba in. Uh, in Palermo, you can see the, the arabesque here. And that's, I thought that was one of the prettiest examples of the Arab architecture. And you can see it, you can see the mixing of the different styles, for example, um, in the Cathedral of Palermo, where you have, um, you have like a, this use of vertical, um, like a kind of a exaggerated sense of be, the building being vertical that comes from the Normans. Um, also, like the use of, um, you don't see too many here in this particular image, but the you know, mixing with the pointed arches that come from, um, from the, the Muslims, the towers on the sides of facades, that was more like a, a Norman tradition. And then inside, and this is in the Capella Palatina, you again have all this mixing. You have, um, you have geometric forms, you know, that are, that really, are so prized in, in um, Arabic architecture. You have incredible tile work. You have, of course, so you have Christian motifs, but also Arabic geometric forms. Um, and everything is mixing uh, in a way that's pretty, pretty spectacular in this particular, particular chapel. And we're going to move a little bit, not not exactly into modern day Palermo, but moving a little forward. And I put this image up just because uh, as we go into the streets of Palermo, uh, it just the light was so beautiful that I could not resist putting it up. Um, it's I think we're all ready for some some sunshine and sunlight. And uh, this picture just just made me happy. Um, we're going to go. We're going to move from the sunlight. We're actually we're going to stay in the sunlight for a minute, and then we're going to move out of it. Um, so a little bit more sunlight with a quote from Giuseppe di Lampedusa, um, who is one of Sicily's best known um, modern modern writers, and he's writing here of his childhood home, and he says, "At no point on earth, on, on earth, I'm sure, has sky ever stretched more violently blue than it did above our enclosed terrace." Never has sun thrown gentler rays than those penetrating the half-closed shutters of the green drawing room. Never have damp marks on a courtyard's outer walls presented shapes more stimulating to the imagination than those at my home. Um, I am writing of his childhood. And this is actually a, a picture um, from, the, from his childhood home, from the um, Palazzo Lampedusa. And you can see here the full palazzo um, looking looking in ruins. So so why is that? So um, the the Lampedusa the Villa Lampedusa was heavily destroyed in the Allied bombings of 1943. Um, Sicily was the launching place for the Allied um, invasion of Italy to uh, free it from Mussolini. And this really depressed Lampedusa, who came from an old aristocratic family that was 
had been kind of seeing this the whole you know this this whole aristocratic um background of sicily like in like in some other places too had been on this slow decline and the damage and partial destruction of the house really depressed lampedusa so he started um writing what is his only novel and uh, um kind of the cornerstone of our readings for the trip the leopard il gatto bardo um recalling the kind of the this both the how could i say like the i don't know if de is decayed splendor is that too much that might be too much but the uh the story of this family of this noble family um during the during the 1860s during the time of um Gar the invasion of sicily by garibaldi to as part of the unification of italy um so a you know when at the sicily was a kingdom uh, before that just like many other parts of uh, italy were were independently ruled and the country was not united um and that you know really marked a turning point the unification of italy marked a turning point for the fortunes of this fictional family that he talks about and he really captures the the, the feeling of um the, diff the huge mix of emotions that come with the change um and he he didn't live i don't think he lived to see the publication of the book he died in 1957 and um he had been trying to get his book published but it was rejected um, by many different publishers it was ultimately published after his death yeah and you can see here um an interior courtyard that he's talked about now restored the um at least part of the villa or the palazzo lampedusa is a hotel so it has been restored this is all pretty i don't i'm not sure if the restoration work is fully finished because this it's all it's all quite recent that this restoration has been done but you can see that interior courtyard and just a little passage from il gatto paolo the leopard that illustrates this sort of um melancholy and also the the de the very evocative um descriptions of of palermo and of the sicilian countryside that are characteristic of the book so um don fabrizio the main character is traveling in a coach at night um and they're approaching palermo which is he's plunged in complete darkness it's low shuttered houses weighed down by the huge edifices of convents and monasteries there were dozens of these all vast often grouped in twos or threes for women and men rich and poor noble and plebeians for jesuits benedictines franciscans capuchins Carmelites, Redemptorists, Augustinians. Above them rose squat domes and flabby curves like breasts emptied of milk. But it was the religious houses which gave the city its grimness and its character, its sedateness and its sense of death, which not even the vibrant Sicilian sunlight could ever manage to disperse. And at that hour, that night, they were despots of the scene. It was against them, really, that the bonfires were lit on the walls stoked by men who were themselves very like those living in the monasteries below, as fanatical, as self-absorbed, as avid for power, or rather for the idleness which was for them the purpose of power. Now the road was crossing orange groves in flower, and the nuptial scent of the blossoms absorbed all the rest as a full moon absorbs the landscape. Um, so a really interesting, and evocative um observations both about the landscape and about human nature as you know as there are these real fundamental questions about um about power in in italy uh, so we're going to move on from the leopard and move on from palermo to agrigento or agrigentine uh, in sicilian and Agrigento is part of the Valley of the Temples, as you can see here, this incredible temple of Concordia, um, which I think is 5th century BCE. Um, and we have a, a great quote from Maupassant, who was again, one of these many, many writer travelers in 
Sicily. He says that it seems that all Olympus is before us, the Olympus of Homer, of Ovid, of Virgil, the Olympus of God's delightful, sensual, passionate. Um, and it, he really captures the, the drama and the grandeur of this incredible valley. Um, this temple of Concordia especially is one of the best preserved Doric temples in, uh, in, the, in the Mediterranean. Uh, it's, it's something else. I have to, I, every time I look at it, I, I feel like a, a little bit of excitement, like I want to, I want to go there right now. And um, you, you have, a, and they, so just to give you a little sense of, of the other parts of this valley of the temples here, you have much more ruined um, temple of, of Juno um, that is in also part of this complex. And, oops, sorry, I'm not quite ready to go there yet. Um, and and um, so you can, this is going to be part of the visit, visit it, visiting this temple, visiting this temple complex and um, seeing um, the, the extent of um, the ruins in both, both Greek and Roman. And we're gonna, this is this is just a little image of um, modern Agrigento, and you can you can see I put it in here partly because it just demonstrates all these layers that um, Roberto Alamo, Alamo talked about. The we had the quote at the beginning of the presentation, where Sicily being una cipolla, an onion, and you and you can kind of this is a visual representation of that. You can see um, skyscrapers from a lot of them from the 60s and beyond um, mixed with um, some of the medieval town, and then you have this uh, ancient, ancient city just just near the main town, and this kind of this kind of layering was very interesting to one writer in particular who was from the Agrigento area, grew up in a suburb right near Agrigento, uh, Luigi Parandello, and he says, "I'm therefore a son of chaos, and not allegorically." But in reality, and he, it's a it's a a play on words because the um, the standard Italian for this suburb of Agrigento where he's from is called is called Caos K A O S. Uh, but you have also, of course, uh, the concept of chaos, right? This um, this void or this gap, which um, came into being when when all the elements uh, that were, you know, all the elements were kind of blended into one mass and then they separated to form heaven and earth at the beginning of time um, in, in uh, Greek mythology. And, you know, we often think of chaos as a, um, as a, a, a huge jumble of things, right? Where, where it's hard to distinguish one thing from another and that that meaning does come from mythology as well, but you also have this idea of a vo of a void or a gap of this kind of primeval void. And um, Pirandello was really interested in exploring um, the the nature of reality. Um, he he wrote he's best known in the U.S. perhaps for six characters in search of an author, but he he was very prolific. He wrote a number of plays and novels and won the Nobel Prize for Italy in 19, or won the Nobel Prize in 1934. And, um, you know, he's, he talks a lot about appearances, ver appearances versus reality, um, about people have often, people in his, in his works often are reshaping themselves or reforming themselves out of some, some kind of material or spiritual or psychic void and i'm going to talk about that a little more in one second you can see his um childhood home here that's now a museum that's one of the places that we're going to visit on the trip and um a, a so an excerpt from one of his works that i hope will illustrate illustrate a little bit more about what i mean this is from a novel called um the late mattia pascal and Mattia Pascal has he's unsatisfied with his with his life and he 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 kind of flees and then a corpse is discovered that that uh, the 
the people in his his family and other people in his town think is him. And so he lets that he lets that uh he plays that game, right? He pretends to be pretends to be dead, but he realizes that his new life is really just as rootless and unreal as his old one and so then he's kind of in a bind because everyone thinks he's dead so and he and this one passage i think talks about the difficulty of knowing yourself and and this idea of masks and and what do we present to who and why so that matia pascal says sometimes passing my hands over my face and finding it beardless or running them through my hair and finding it so long or adjusting those strange blue glasses to my little nose, I would experience a curious bewilderment, as though it were not myself whom I was touching, as though I were no longer the man I had always been, pacing issues squarely. The truth was that all this new makeup was for other people, not for myself. Well then, why wear the mask in my own presence? And if all I had invented and imagined in connection with Adrian Omeis was not for the benefit of other people, for whose benefit was it? For mine. Adriano Mace is the is the name that he takes when he escapes being Mattia Pascal. Uh, so we're gonna leave Pirandello and continue. So just to just to remind you real quick where we are. Go back here. Uh, so we were in the Agrigento in the surrounding area with the Valley of the Kings. We're going to head along the south coast here, eventually to Ragusa. But before we do, we're going to make a little stop in Noto, um, which is known for it's Baroque architecture. The, uh, there's a, a very well-preserved city center, and a lot of it is in um, in this kind of golden stone. Um, Vincent Cronin in the Golden Honeycomb writes a lot about a lot about it. Um, and there's a very harmonious there's a really har harmonious feel um, to the town to the town as a whole that um, you don't often see, even in other towns that are that are that are quite well preserved. This is maybe one of the very best preserved and lots of beautiful details to admire and to consider. And uh, you, so you can see um, the cathedral here in Noto, the facade from, from the side. And uh, a little detail from uh, showing this, um, the, the different shapes, the, cur the, here, the different shapes, the curls, um, and you see, you see classical elements, but also this kind of Baroque flamboyance as well. And I put this poem um, by the Polish poet, who's uh, quite, who spent a fair amount of time in Sicily, Adam Zagajewski, um, because I like the contrast of this perfectly preserved, harmonious town with the questions that um, are raised in this poem. He says, Noto, a town that would be flawless if only our faith were greater. Noto, a Baroque town where even the stables and arbors are ornate. The cathedral's cupola has collapsed. Alas, and heavy cranes surround it like do doctors in a hospital tending the dangerously ill. Afternoons, town teenagers gather on the main street and board stiff, whistle like captive thrushes. The town is too perfect for its inhabitants. Um, so, you know, what, what does that mean if we, how is it that our lack of faith introduces some kind of flaw into the town in the first couple of lines? What does he mean by that? A town that would be flawless if only our faith were greater. And this question that, you know, yeah, it's so well preserved. It's so beautiful to look at. Um, does that have a flip side? And that's one of the, that's one of the interesting things I think about visiting Sicily as a whole, right? We saw this with Lampedusa, we see this as well, this light and dark, right? This this love of the sunlight and, and the blue sky, but also this melancholy and and um and the dark side of this aristocratic decline. Um we you see it, um I'm not gonna talk so much about it 
um, today just because of her lack of time, but I will have some more information in the resources. Um, you know, an, an island that is so abundant, so rich in natural resources, so bright, um, but you do have dark, darker sides of, of poverty, um, the mafia, which uh, one author in particular, Leonardo Sharsha, writes about. Um, so there's there's all these there's always this contrast, this play of light and dark um, that I think makes the literature of Sicily very compelling and and the island itself. We're gonna arrive now in Ragusa, uh, just a really uh, really lovely hill town. And I th think this image, you know, there's a lot of these uh, a lot of these uh, beautiful hilltop towns th throughout Italy. Um, and especially in Sicily, which is mostly mountainous, and this panorama just just um, gives you a sense of how these towns are perched perched upon the hills. And I wanted to share a little bit of the golden honeycomb that I mentioned earlier. Um, Vincent Cronin is talking about. So here you have, sorry, here you have the church, Guza. And then he's gonna, he's talking about climbing up. He says, the journey from Ragusa Superiore to the cathedral takes half an hour, the way being entirely by flights of steps. Not an orderly continuous stairway, but irregular, erratic goat paths, which wind like tangled skeins of wool in and around the houses and sweep under bridges, long flat steps and narrow steep grace notes, tumbling down like a cascade following the line of least resistance to the gorge below. Um, don't worry, we won't make you climb up steps for half an hour. Um, but I just thought that really captured the, the feeling of being um, in Ragusa in particular and in these winding hill towns, um, these paths that diverge and seem so erratic. And we are going to make our last big city stop in Syracuse, Syracuse. Um, let me just, I should have put another map further in. So we're kind of going to go up here to Syracuse. And let me just go back to where we were. And um, I don't know this this picture. It might have a filter. I don't know, but uh, you know, capturing the golden hour in Syracuse, and, and that, but the golden light was so irresistible that I could not resist um, using this image. And, and the quote from Lawrence Durrell that I think captures some of the feeling of of being in Syracuse. One day she dies, and there with splendor on all sides of her, for miles and miles, stretches reality in all its rich ubiquity, the whole of science, magic, total time. I've always loved that little poem by Durrell. And here you have a, uh, a more panoramic view of Syracuse with Mount Etna in the background. That'll be our final point. And um, there's there's a couple, the city is divided in a, in a few different parts. So you have this, um, oops, sorry, my mouse is stuck here. Ah, okay. So you have the island, um, and, and a lot of our visit to Syracuse will be centered on the island of, or ah, sorry, my mouse is really stuck. Island of Ortigia, which comes from, which comes from the Greek word for quail. Um, and a lot of the attractions of the old city are found there. Um, there's also uh, theater ruins, Roman theater, and a Greek theater. And I should have put the Greek theater first because it's, uh, you know, it came for first chronologically, but I didn't because I wanted to show you how um, this, uh, how the old blends into the new. So first I'm going to read this little passage. Um, from the Eumenides or the Furies by Aeschylus. Aeschylus um, traveled to Sicily two, at least two times that are known, possibly three, um, 
you know, he had his dramas uh, performed and in um, in Sicily. You know, he was uh, considered the father of tragedy and um, won a lot of competitions for drama, both in Sicily and elsewhere. Um, he was see, 525 to 455 BCE. Um, so those, you know, his plays would have been performed at this theater, and they, they they still are today. There still are um, festivals of ancient Greek theater in Syracuse. And here he's calling. Uh, here Orestes has presented himself um, before Minerva, before the temple of Minerva, and he says, "Hither, divine Minerva, by command of Phoebus, I am come. Propitious power, receive me. By the Furies, torturing rage pursued." No vile, unhallowed wretch, nor stained with guilty blood, but worn with toil and spent with many a painful step to other shrines and in the paths of men. By land, by sea, wearied alike, obedient to the voice, the oracle of Phoebus, I approach thy shrine, thy statue, goddess, here to fix my stand till judgment shall decide my cause. And the temple that Orestes, well, there are lots of temples to Minerva throughout the ancient world, um, but there was one in Syracuse. Uh, I don't think it's this particular one that he's referring to, but there, but um, this, but the temple here was a temple to Minerva, and you can see that the temple has been incorporated, um, was incorporated into the later Christian church. And you can see the facade of that church here. And you can see the side where we just were. And one of the, uh, we're going to return uh, to one more Greek myth. Um, here's like a kind of fish eye view of. Um, the fountain of Aratusa, and you can see papyrus growing in there. If I'm not mistaken, it's the only other place in the Mediterranean that papyrus grows besides uh, in Egypt. And what and this fountain is very famous in Syracuse um, because it relates to another, um, just like the myth of uh, um, Ceres and. Proserpina relates to another important myth. So um, Arethusa was a, a nymph and a servant of Artemis, um, and kind of a patron, a patron figure of of ancient Syracuse. And this spring is said to be where she returned to the Earth's surface after escaping from her under under Earth or undersea home. So she was she was bathing in a stream that she didn't realize. The stream was itself the the god Al, uh, Alpheus, and Alpheus falls in love with her, right, and wants her to stay. But she wants to remain a servant of of Artemis, so she tries to escape, and um, she helped by Artemis, who agrees to um, to let her come up, come up from underground. And the point where she comes up is said to be this spring. And lots of um, lots of people have written about this myth in poetry and have written poems about the fountain. Um, so John Milton, in his poem Lycidas, he writes about this myth. Um, Shelley, I believe, um, both both Percy Bysshe Shelley and Mary Shelley um, wrote a lot about. They they were they were focused more on Venice, but they also did come to Sicily and wrote a lot about. Um, Sicily, kind of um, Mary, she Mary Shelley wrote a play um, set in Sicily, and uh, Percy Shelley wrote a lot of poetry that um, speaks to this classical tradition in Sicily. And we're going to end our virtual tour um, just to the north of Syracuse. Well, a little bit more, a little bit, a little ways to the north of Syracuse on Mount Etna. Um, ah, boil up ye vapors, leap and roar, thou sea of fire, my soul glows to meet you. And this is actually from a poem by the Victorian 
uh, British Victorian poet Matthew Arnold. Um, it's, he, it's not known, he did travel, but it's not known that he ever went to Mount Etna, but he was so steeped in the classical tradition that he was able to write this poem about, uh, about these vapors and my soul glows to greet you. And we have another image of Etna or um, from Teresa Maggio, author of the Stone Boudoir. And she is writing about the feast of uh, St. Agatha. Um, and who is the patron saint of Catania, uh, which is just at the base of Mount Etna. She's, there's this, she's uh, participating in this festival to St. Agatha. And she says, when the sun turned blue velvet, the Fercolo moved off slowly with a hundred ten pound candles blazing as Agatha was hauled up the boulevard towards Etna. The mountain was a geyser of fire, but Agatha smiled at it. So there's this kind of, you know, a statue or effigy of, of the saint being carried up amidst all these uh, glowing candles. And um, so we have, we have Christian saints being worshipped near Etna. We have, but we also, of course, have classical roots of Etna. It was uh, traditionally the home to the forge of Hephaestus or Vulcan. And for the Roman name, and the thunderbolts of Zeus were made there. It was also the burial place of the hundred-headed monster uh, Typhus, Typhus and uh, Ovid and a lot of others write about that. And the name itself is believed to have come after another nymph, Aetne, um, who actually kind of helped um, Hephaestus and Demeter or Ceres. Um, Ne negotiate who would have control of Sicily because they were they were arguing over who would have control of Sicily. Um, so here you have um, a 17th century painting of the forge of Hephaestus or Vulcan. And I went so still staying on Mount Etna, but just a little a little sidebar. It wouldn't be. Uh, right to speak about Sicily without talking a little bit about the food and drink. And I have a quote here from the wine writer Robert Camuto, um, who says, uh, I see in wine metaphors for us all. Wine to me is food, physical and spiritual, an expression of humanity and nature, and that zone where the two merge into something larger. In the communion of in this communion of life forces, I know of no place richer than Sicily. No place at this moment that has more to say. And he's showing some vines here around Mount Etna. It's a very fertile, uh, it's a very fertile area. So S Sicily provides a lot of agricultural products um, throughout the island, but especially around Mount Etna, these volcanic soils are really rich. And um, when a, just a, a couple, couple of uh, great varieties for you to think about that come from Sicily. Um, the Nerolo Mascalese and the Caricante. And uh, just a little bit of, little description of each of those. Um, the Caricante especially is really coming into its own more recently. Um, is a, you know, the, a lot of Sicily and other parts of Italy, right, have been known for um, making large quantities of, of wine that, you know, wasn't, Always so distinctive, um, but but you know through the through the 20th century, but uh, there's always been um, you know, smaller producers who have been devoted to growing these grapes, these these indigenous grapes, and bringing like a bringing a full expression to them. And there's you know there's a lot of interest in this now, especially with with natural wines and small producers. Um, which, which I think is great. I like. I, I'm a huge fan of natural wines. My husband and I. Um, that's pretty much all we drink right now. But uh, you know, there's always been these these smaller players that have been focused on these local grapes and really producing for quality and not quantity. Um, and you can so you can find really special um, bottles made with with these local grapes. Um, and you might you might look at the saline flavor. I don't know, but I trust me, it's it's uh, it's delicious. And I the tube, so I put two bottles up by 
um, Planeta, which is um, um, a vineyard and an agriturismo where we're going to stay for a few days on the trip. It's, um, it's actually closer to, um, to Agrigento. Um, excuse me. But there's lots of producers around Edna as well. So just a couple of grape varieties uh, for you to think about. And of course, not just grapes, but so many other products. Um, and here you have the early blooming almond trees and a, a little line from Leonardo Shasha in his um, book, Sicilian Uncles, kind of recalling the, the fruits of, of Sicily. We used a goat track, which took us to a stone quarry and then out to the open countryside. There was fruit there, almonds, green and bitter on the outside, white as milk inside, curd almonds, we called them, and may plums, just as sour and green, which make the mouth dry. Um, so of course, you know, there's almonds, plums, and of course, lots of citrus, right? Especially Sicily is very known for its citrus um, fish being, you know, being an island. And I'll leave you with a final quote from Teresa, Ma uh, Teresa Maggio. This is showing the fish market in Catania. Damn, I love the, I love the guy on the left here. Uh, in her book, she writes, in Sicily, where food is love and the street is a stage, street food is more than a cheap meal. It's communion. And, you know, of course, she's, you're right, Sicily and, and Italy itself is heavily influenced by Catholicism. Um, but even if you don't come from a Catholic or a Christian background, I think that feeling of being out on the street, sharing food together uh, is, is open to everybody. It's a, it is a experience of connection and community, uh, you, you know, whether even the humblest, even the humblest uh, dish, I'm sure, you, like I have many, many happy memories of gr grabbing something from the street in your travels and you look back 10 or 15 years later and maybe you're sharing with friends or maybe you chat with a couple of strangers and maybe it could be one of the happiest memories of your trip. And uh, so we're also going to be taking some street food tours um, in Palermo and elsewhere. Uh, there's a ton to sample, uh, including some offbeat stuff that... Uh, uh, I hope that you will give it a go. Um, so that is just about it. And we're going to let Gota have the last word. Um, in later writing of his, 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 as he wrapped up his 40-day visit to Sicily, he wrote, the voyage through Sicily is now happily completed and will be for me an indestructible treasure for my whole life. And I do want to show just I, I want to show you my sources. Of course, um, a lot of these uh, you know images are kindly shared with people on through Creative Commons and other other sources. So I just wanted to give credit to all the sources that I used. And thank you so much. Again, if you uh, if you want to get to Sicily in real life, um, we are feeling very confident. Uh, we there's light at the end of this pandemic tunnel, and we do still have some places on the trip. Um, it had been sold out for when it was originally it was originally scheduled for earlier, but, um, but then was moved for the pandemic. And we do have a few places on it. Uh, it's November 10th to 21st, 2021, and you can contact. Worldwide Quest or me at Classical Pursuits, and we will answer any questions. Through the end of March, we have our special uh, $50 deposit. Um, so just $50 to reserve your place on any Worldwide Quest trip, not just a Classical Pursuits trip. And those deposits are transferable. Uh, you know, we're being as flexible as we can, knowing that there is still, un you know, it's been, a, it's been a long and uncertain year for everyone, but we're feeling really good about this trip and hope that you will consider joining. So again, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. And I will put my interface back on.
and uh, let Wendy come back on and take some questions. Thanks, everyone. Hello, and thank you, Melanie. I have to say, uh, what a beautiful, beautiful slideshow. Uh, so yes. many people, thank you so much for those of you who've been putting in your questions uh, and, and your comments. So many comments about just how stunningly beautiful the place is. And, and I gotta say, yeah, let's go, let's go to Italy. Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Wendy. <laughs> See here it's only noon for me and I still have to do some work so I can't I can't quite yet, but I I am going to have a caricante with tonight's dinner. I, I have I, it all set up. Are you ready? It's a mescalze. Uh so uh I you know I drink red. So uh I thought it was appropriate and since uh if if we were in Italy right now we could be sitting out somewhere and and enjoying a glass together uh since we weren't i've had it sitting here waiting for you it's me having a virtual glass of wine to toast uh, you and and this wonderful uh trip that you've taken us through uh for those of you who are watching if you have questions for melanie please put your questions in the either the questions area or in the, the chat box um i had i had a, a question for you just as no. i wait for some some more questions to come in but I have this question. You you mentioned at one point in time about the light and dark that seems to come up over and over again in so many of the both the myths, but also in the literature. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about about where you think that comes from. Hmm. I think I think you know, I, and I, I'm not a you know I'm not a historian um, or. Ooh. I don't even know the word you would study for somebody or somebody who wrote like the golden bow, right. Or with the James Frazier and like kind of looking at the origins of all these myths and where they come from. But I would say in my own kind of my own, my own answer is just somebody who loves to read and loves arts and history and literature um, is, you know, partly the, a lot of these Greek myths, right. They do, they, they have that themselves, these Greek and Roman myths. They have a, they have, um, a lot of violence, a lot of darkness, a lot, uh, but they also explain, you know, they explain so much of how the Greeks and Romans understood the world. So, you know, they explain um, rhythms and patterns. And I think in any kind of rhythm and pattern of, of the earth, right, you have, you have dark times, you have light times, you have times of plenty and times of scarcity, times of fallow and times of growth. So maybe, maybe it's partly that, um, I think just the, you know, you, you do have this place that is so, um, has so much physical light so for, for a lot of the year, right? It's a very, it's, a, um, um, and you might even, for those of you who are thinking November, I don't know, it, it's not going to be too cold. Like it's, it's, uh, that's a beautiful time. Um, you know, so there's a lot of physical light. There's a lot of, there's a, you know, a lot of flowers and brightness and growth. Um, but you, wherever you have people, right, you're going to have light and dark. So, um, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't have time to talk a lot about him, but, but Leonardo Shasha uh, writing about the, the mafia, which has, you know, long origins, like going back to the middle ages, um, you know, it's considered it's it's this kind of shadow system that that can be operating alongside the the regular system, um, and even even an organization like that is complex, right? Because you there is a lot of there's violence and corruption, um, but people, you know, in and you might say, well, in the beginning, it was a way to provide services for people that people that were that were needed. Um, so it itself is maybe not all darkness. And with the with the Lampedusa, I think, yeah, I mean, whenever you see this, this, um, this shift, right, shifts in power that result in the, the change in the way people live, mm -hmm. um, I think there's a melancholy to that. And I think, you know, what, what Lampedusa, he's not writing about it, um, he's not writing about the um, Don Fabrizio, the Prince of Selena. He's not writing about him in a pitying way. Like there's a, there's a melancholy 
um, and a melancholy that he, he feels in his own life, right? Because his own family was this, were these aristocrats who, who were just kind of fading away as times change. And there is a sadness to that. Mm -hmm. um, so th there is this, in the midst of the events of the leopard, there is a sadness even among the abundance of Palermo and even among the energy uh, that's that uh, Garibaldi is kind of mm. stirring up. Yeah. Um, and you see this, there's a, there's a book, I didn't, um, there's a book called The Silent Duchess um, by, I think, Dasha, I'm gonna, let me make sure I say it. Um, yes. Dasha Marini, the Silent Duchess, um, that I think had um, also like set in an earlier time that I, I'll include that on my reading list. That um, rings the same feeling of 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 light and darkness. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting, right? The natural environment and the way that it gets reflected in in the politics of the place and in the interior life. Uh, just before I go to a question, um, you were mentioning uh, the Lampedusa. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, highly recommend. This is Stephen Price's novel called Lampedusa, uh, which is about his his life and uh, the writing of the leopard. And I think so much of what you just said gets worked out there. So again, Stephen Price's Lampedusa. It was shortlisted for a bunch of awards here in Canada last year, but a, a great novel to sit down and read. Uh, if you're doing some more armchair traveling, getting ready to actually uh, head off to Italy. Um, I have a couple of questions, uh, Melanie, for you. Um, Arlette, thanks very much for your question. She's asking if you're going to see the mosaics in Piazza Amarina. Yes, uh, yes, I did not cover that. Oh, sorry, go. Uh, yes, I did not cover that. Um, sorry, my, can, you, can you all hear me if I take my headphones off? Yeah. They're they're kind of they're starting to hurt my ears with my glasses, so I'm gonna go headphoneless for for the moment. Um, yeah, we I didn't uh, I didn't talk about that just for lack of time in the in the presentation. But yes, um, this is a Roman villa that has um, really detailed mosaics of and, and so we sh we I showed the mosaics in the Capella Palatina in Palermo. You know, and those are a lot of religious figures, right? Um, Christ and saints and icons. Uh, the mosaics in this uh, villa are, uh, it, it was a private Roman villa, and there are animals, there's all kinds of animals um, from, that you would find in Africa. Um, it's believed that, you know, a lot of the workers on this, uh, a lot of the mosaic workers on this villa were um, Muslim Arab workers who, you know, who, who were um, part of this, like, influence on Sicily that continued even after um, um, oh wait sorry wait uh, not not those same workers because sorry I'm like <laughs> I'm conflating two different times in my head uh, to I'm completely completely conflating two different things totally um, but there, there are animal there are animal figures in in these um, mosaics and also figures of people in everyday life um, women wearing kind of um, bikini type things. These are like, the, those are some of the more famous ones, uh, the women in the bikinis, everybody likes to see that, uh, th that particular mosaic. Um, so yes, that will be part of the trip. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, and thank you everybody. Uh, thank you, I have Joanna and Mary and uh, Linda. Uh, so many people sharing memories of their time uh, and visits to Sicily. I have another question about the trip. Uh, this comes from Linda. She's asking if you'll be staying at the Butera 28 with the Duchess uh, while you're on the trip. At the, say that again, sorry. It's, I think it's Butera, B-U-T-E-R-A 28 with the Duchess. Just bringing to mind. Not that I'm aware. So in, in Palermo, we're, we're at the Porta Felice. Um, we're a few days in, um, oh, sorry, let me just, uh, let me, we're a few days in uh, Planeta. And um, let me just, 
Do I have the? I, I, I might have to get back to you on that question because I'm, I'm. Or maybe I just don't. Maybe I'm not following something. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll be sure to to uh, Linda to to check those. Yeah, uh, Linda, I will certainly follow up with you on that. I can help with a question actually. Sorry to interrupt. Nice. <laughs> yeah, um, Melanie, you're right. We are staying at the Hotel Porto Felice in Palermo. And the hotel that she's talking about, the Butera 28, that's also in Palermo. So the answer is no, we're not staying at that one that she stayed at. Okay, that's what I okay, that's what I thought, but I wasn't sure. Okay, thank you, Sam. Yeah, I don't have I I uh have the itinerary, but I was I have so many papers. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No problem. Uh, we have some more suggestions for uh, some something that you might like to read. Thanks, Joanne. Joanne said uh, she uh, loves the author Andrea Camilleri. It's lighter fiction, lots of fun, and lots of insights into Sicilian culture. Uh, so thank you again, everybody, for sharing your memories of, of trips you've made and the like. We did have a question about. Um, uh, COVID measures and the trip. And I was wondering if, if um, maybe Sam or maybe you, Melanie, uh, have any ideas about whether there'll be protocols or whether those uh, decisions have been made yet. Um, I know that Worldwide Quest has, you know, they've spent a lot of time working out protocols, Sam. Um, and I, I know you, um, there's a whole series of Kind of there's a there's a clear, very clearly defined decision framework for for traveling. Um, Sam, do you want me to direct people to the website? Do you want me to say anything more about that right now? Or yeah, if you go to our website worldwidequest.com, you'll see a link to go to the special booking terms. And again, like you said, we have those four point criteria where if those four safety points aren't met, then we won't go. We'll postpone mm -hmm. until the next year. So we're only going to go if it's safe to do so. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. If you want more details on what those four points are, check out our website. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We won't we won't travel until it's safe. Um, it's really important, you know, that everybody, you know, I know Worldwide Quest has spent a lot of time working on this, and that is the priority. Yeah. Um, one. Well, I did want to say about Camilleri. Yes, I didn't. I also I didn't get to the inspector Montalbano. Um, a lot of his a lot of his work. A lot of the uh, it's a, this detective, um, uh, the the protagonist of these works by um, Camilleri. Uh, a lot of them are set down in the area of um, sort sort of near uh, near Agrigento. And I did not get to talk about ins the inspector, but um, I will include information about that on the reading list. Um, I, because I love, I absolutely love detective fiction. Um, I like Montalbano. I love the, um, the Aurelio Zen, who he's more of a Venetian. He's a Venetian detective. I don't know if anybody reads the uh, Zen books by Michael Dibden. Um, and and there's another. Uh, there, there's a tons of. Uh, Tons of um, uh, great detective fiction set in Sicily and all over Italy. Um, so I will definitely include more information about about um, Camilleri as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Melanie, for this trip. Until it's safe and until it's you know the world opens up again for us to travel, it's so wonderful to be able to travel uh, through this medium, uh, through the literature and also the images. Uh, I'm I'm ready to go. You ready to go? I'm so ready. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and I hope all of you have enjoyed this afternoon. Like I said, until we can, it's safe, and until we can travel. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today uh, for this uh, literary and gorgeous images. By the way, uh, thank you to all who contribute to the Creative Commons. It makes our job so much easier. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us today through this tour. Uh, remember, if you have more information about the trip itself, you can contact Melanie at Classical Pursuits or Samantha at Worldwide Quest. And uh, we will be seeing you uh, soon. I think, Melanie, next up, Dutch Masters? Yes. Yeah, so uh, next week, we are uh, returning with Armchair Art Tours. Um, Sean Forrester, who is a longtime Classical Pursuits and Worldwide Quest leader as well, he'll be talking about uh, he, he's going to spend two weeks talking about Dutch Masters. Um, he's leading our Japan trip in November of 2021, so another trip in November. 
um, that we are also feeling very good about. And then he'll be leading a trip to Amsterdam in September of 2022, um, focusing on, on Dutch and Flemish painting. So he'll be back to, um, to talk about that for the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I know, Wendy, you're going to be coming back as well. So we have a lot more in, in store for all of you this spring and summer. Wonderful. Thank you again, everybody, for spending some time with us this afternoon. And thank you so much, Melanie, for your, uh, your hard work and your presentation. Have a lovely afternoon or morning or evening, wherever you might be. Uh, and thanks again. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you to everyone. See you next week.